counted monthly, and we are looking to have $8,000 after three years. So part of this is really just a formula thing. Um, and we can kind of dissect where that formula is coming from. There is an eraser in the room, okay. So in terms of our formula for compound interest, um, we can have different letters put on this, but one of the standard ones is that we write this as A equals P times one plus, are you putting it as, oops, R over N. That's an R, I swear. I wrote an N, but it's an R. Don't mind me. R over N to the N times T. Anytime that we are, anytime that we're talking about compound interest, the N right here is referring back to how many times it's compounding in one year. So if we're doing it monthly, then that means that our N is equal to 12. So monthly N is equal to 12. So we're taking that 7.2% interest. First of all, we're gonna have to write that as a decimal. So to change from like using the percent symbol to switching that to a decimal, I can either put the whole thing over 100 or move the decimal over two places. So this would look like one plus, I'm gonna just move the decimal over. So 0 0.072 divided by 12. N is 12, T is the number of years. So in this case, that's three years. The A is referring to the amount that I have in my account. So in this case, $8,000 is how much we want to have in the account. And P stands for principal, but that just means what, how much did we originally deposit in there? At this point, you pull out a calculator. There isn't like, just plug all that garbage into a calculator, divide both sides by it. Questions about that? Because this one really is just use that formula. And I am checking for questions online too, so you're welcome to pop in with questions in there. Questions? Uh, I have questions um, from the first set of problems. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's e to the uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So there is a. I do want to address a question in the chat, which says your teacher doesn't let you use calculators. That's okay. You're just going to leave the answer as 8,000 divided by garbage. So you don't have to put it into account. You can leave that as P equals 8,000. I mean, if any of the numbers are easy to do in your head, go for it. But otherwise, really, you're just going to leave it as I can do 12 times three in my head, but otherwise you're just going to leave it as this garbage. You're, there's no expectation that you're like doing something to that. Sorry, just want to make sure I address that. So in terms of, um, oh, more questions on this. So there's a question about the rate and whether I should have moved the decimal point over or not. Thoughts? So should this have been 7.2 divided by 12 instead of 0 0.072 divided by 12? The question is in the formula, is that rate seven, does this mean that it's already accounted for it as a percentage is really what the question is. So here's how we're going to deal with that. 
let's back the question up for a second. And let's just think about if this is compounded monthly, let's actually go through and see what happens, how much money we have after one month. So different kind of problem, but let's say that I deposit 8,000, no, let's say I deposit $1,000. And I'm getting a 7.2% annual percentage rate, but we're compounding monthly. So I'm going to have to divide that by 12. Does, it, does anything nice happen when we divide it by 12? I'm going to use a calculator just because I want the, to deal with the numbers. So 7.2 divided by 12. So that's 0.6. I thought it worked out nice. So that's 0.6. So after one month, I should have a 0.6% increase in the amount of stuff that, in the amount of money I have in there. So if I'm going to have a 0.6% increase and I needed to calculate that, well, I started with a thousand and now I'm going to add to that 0.6% of a thousand. But to find 0.6% of a thousand, I would have to take that point six divided by a hundred and then multiply by a thousand. So I guess I'm looping back around to, if we're going to calculate a percentage of something, we really have to calculate it by taking the number and either moving the decimal point over two places or dividing by a hundred. Um, now, how does the formula change if it switches to being continuous instead of compound interest. And I'll be honest, I don't know why we're doing any of the, these interest problems, but I think someone has decided that econ majors should know how compound interest works or something. No one's calculating compound interest by hand. There are calculators that do this stuff. Um, but, the entire excuse for talking about compound interest is because it's one of the best mathy ways to lead into exponential functions. That's, it's really just an excuse to do that. So when we talk about um, compounded continuously, we're taking this formula, one plus R over N, oops, one plus R over N, times n to the t. And if we're going to compound it continuously, we're really saying let's take the limit as n gets huge. Well, if we just kind of think about this logically for a second, and I'm going to ignore the p part, it's just some number. But if I look at this next part, and we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity, and I have 1 plus r divided by n to the n times t, well, if we just think about this as a limit problem, no matter what r is, it's some number. Like, let's say it's 0.5. But whatever the number is, when we divide it by infinity, this is basically going to zero. So as a limit, this is looking like 1 plus 0. And no matter what time is, when I multiply it by infinity, it is headed to the infinity. Well, this is one of those weird mathy paradoxes because one plus zero is, and it feels like one raised to the infinity should be equal to, because this is like one times one times one times one times one, but it's not. This really, did you guys already talk about this in class? Oh, I'm probably ruining something that your teacher thinks is really cool. Sorry, I'm going to ruin something that they think is really cool. Um, people think logically this ought to look like one to the infinity and it should be equal to one. Yeah? Okay, but let's actually pick some numbers here and see what happens. I'm going to ditch the T for a second because we'll like, whatever, whole thing raised to the T. I just want to focus on this part. And for simplicity, 
let's pick a value for R. Like somebody pick a number. Okay. Now, we can't really go to infinity, but how about we just pick a number 100? So we're going to do 1 plus 5 divided by 100 raised to the 100. I'm doing it on my handy dandy phone calculator. One plus five, you can play along. One plus five divided by 100 raised to the 100. Did I get that right? One plus five, I don't know. I'm having issues with my phone right now. There we go. Two the one hundred. And people got some number. Did you all do it? No, I did it. It's not anywhere close to one. Let's make it bigger. Let's take it to like a thousand. Oh, I know what my problem is. The magic I was trying to do. It's only going to work if we have a one up here. And we'll change it to not a one in a minute, but we're gonna do it with a one because then the numbers are gonna be easier for me to do in my head. You ready? One over a thousand, that's like 0. 0.0001. So this part right here is 1.00 tenth hundredths thousandths. Okay, and then I'm gonna raise that to the 1000 power. Dun, dun, dun. 1.001. Oh, okay. 1.001 raised to the 1,000. That's the magic I wanted. It's 2.7 ish. The magic is that this particular limit happens to be equal to E. Okay, your teacher will probably do a better job with that because their tech will be working in their classroom. But the bottom line is that this limit right here is super special. It feels like it ought to be one to the infinity and be equal to one, but it's not because it's one plus almost zero to the infinity. And this particular limit, the one plus almost zero to the infinity, that thing is telling me, oops, we have something to do with that fun little letter E. Where I'm going with all of this is that when we switch from this being compounded monthly, where N is 12, or daily, where N is 365, when we do this continuously, this turns into P E to the R T. And it turns out that when we put in the R right there, this limit becomes E to the R. So when you compound continuously, the formula changes quite a bit. Woohoo! Since we got back around to E, we could start talking about derivatives. Now you all did not do derivatives in class on Friday, did you? Of E to the X, or you did? Did you get there? Okay. Yeah. Wait, he just did what? Like just reviewing the derivative stuff like we did on Friday? Okay. So, do you want to do derivatives in here together today or do you want to wait till after you've seen it somewhere else? I'm okay either way. Now is good? Okay. So no notes just for a second, because I'm just going to draw pictures. Um, thinking back to 16a. Ooh. 
what is the derivative tell me about the graph? And I'm intentionally being open-ended because there are lots of right answers to this. What's something that the derivative tells me about the graph? Will it help if I pick a particular point? So if I was at this point, and I was talking about the derivative at that point, what would the derivative tell me about the graph at that point? Totally, and the increasing or decreasing, I'd be increasing if the derivative was, what kind of a number? Positive or negative? Positive, okay. And I'd be decreasing if the derivative were negative. What else is it gonna tell me? Totally, our set, like our second derivative is gonna let us know whether it's a concave up kind of graph or a concave down kind of graph. And specifically thinking about that first derivative, if I'm looking at it at a particular point, then that derivative is telling me the slope of the curve at a particular point. So, I am positive, or at least I really think, that your instructor is gonna like derive the formula for the derivative of e to the x. I'm just gonna go with proof of concept here for a second using graphs, and then we'll get some practice actually doing it. I'm gonna let him deal with the messy formulas because you won't really be expected to do the messy formulas. You'll be expected to use them. But here's a graph of e to the x. And what I want to do is draw some slopes on this. So, and I don't know if you all had to do this in your 16A class, but one of the things that sometimes we're asked to do is to sketch the function and its derivative. So I wanna take a second and think about what would, if I had to graph the derivative of this function, what would it kind of look like? So based on my tangent lines here, approximately what kind of, what value would you give a slope there? It doesn't have to be perfect, just a decent guess. Sure, like a three or a two. So let's say that's a slope of about two. Well, if that's a slope of about two, then this one might be, sure, because it looks more steep than that. And this one down here, well, that's certainly something less than one, right? So maybe I'll call that like 0.5. And this slope, as I get really far out on the edge of the graph, that slope is getting flatter and flatter and like approaching zero. So if I go to graph these, the graph of my derivative, this axis should be those slope values. So way out here on the edge of the graph, I know the slope is getting close to zero. And right there, I needed a slope of about 0.5. So I don't know. Well, maybe something like that. And then here, we said that was a slope of about two. And then here and here we said it's a slope of about four. And if I kind of connect the dots, something really cool happens because e to the x is its own derivative. It is, in fact, the only function I know of that behaves that way. But if f of x is equal to e to the x, the derivative is also e to the x. Yeah? So like if you were to graph the derivative, it would be the same graph. Correct. Now, would anyone like to go through the messy derivation of like proving this with not just a graph? I'm, I can, like doing limit definition of the derivative stuff. Yeah. 
happy to, don't need to. I got one yes, please, in the Zoom chat. So I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> um, okay. Is everybody okay if I erase my graphs? Because I think I'm going to need the space. Okay. By the way, this is in the textbook, so you don't have to. Um, it is in the textbook, so you can look it up later. You can decide whether you want to take notes now or not. Um, but the first thing that we've got to go back to is that we have these two definitions for the limit of E as a number. And one of them looks like the limit as A approaches infinity. I just picked a letter, by the way. But the limit as A approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over A raised to the A power. But we have this second version, which looks like the limit as, I don't know, I need another letter. How about C approaches zero of one plus T to the one over T. And it's the second one that we're going to exploit in a second. Both of these are equal to E, but it turns out that the second one is kind of more useful for us. Now we've got to remember some stuff from 16A, which is F prime of X as a limit definition of a derivative problem looks like the limit as H approaches zero of F of X plus H minus f of x all over h. Now, hopefully that's not brand new to everybody. That part is definitely supposed to be repeated. So if my function is e to the x, then f of x plus h looks like e to the x plus h. And if I plug that into our limit definition, we're going to end up with The limit as h approaches zero of e to the x plus h minus e to the x all over h. Now the next thing we're going to do is have some fun. We're going to look at that and say, oh, how do we answer a limit problem? We plug the number in and see if anything good happens. But if I plug in zero for h, I just have e to the x minus e to the x, which is zero over h, also zero, not helpful. In general, with a limit problem, when we get zero over zero, we got to go do some algebra. And in this case, the algebra I'm going to do is to factor out an e to the x. And I'm going to do that by thinking about, oh, this came from our additive law of exponents, which means e to the x plus h is the same as e to the x times e to the h. And by writing it this way, I can factor out that e to the x. Oops, not x. So far, so good? Okay, I know I'm writing a little bit low, so I'm gonna have to go up high. I gotta erase this so that I can write up high. The next part, the next step is the magic step.
That's what E equals. And I arbitrarily chose the letter T. But I could have instead chosen the letter H. And nothing would change from this. It would just look like, I really want to be able to use the blue and it just doesn't show up. Sorry. If I rewrite this one, but I swap out the T for H, that's going to look like the limit as H approaches zero of one plus H to the one over H is equal to E. And this version, I'm going to take and stick in right here. And I'm able to do that because both of those are looking at the limit as H approaches zero. Sorry, folks on Zoom. Oh no, I got this. I forgot this room has magic boards. It's not gone. We can bring it back if you have questions. But I got her, I needed more space. We were here. We had the limit as h approaches zero, e to the x, e to the h minus one plus one. What did we have? Minus one all over h. And I was about to do this magic step where I take that e and I replace it with its limit definition part, which means we've got the limit as h approaches zero, e to the x, and that e right there, I mean like giant parentheses or something, but that e right there is going to turn into one plus h to the one over h. That's just the e to the h minus one. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. But all of this is just our definition of E. Now comes the algebra magic. Powers raised to powers, I'm gonna multiply those. Well, one over H times H to give me a one. So I've got limit as H approaches zero e to the x, and now in here, that's a one, which means I have one plus h raised to the one, minus a one, whole thing over h, bam, those ones cancel out, h over h is equal to one, we got e to the x. That's the fancy way to show, I don't know, maybe the graphing way is the fancier way, but Either way, two different ways that we can show that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's not super helpful. Nobody's going to ask you, well, okay. It is unlikely anyone is just going to ask you for the derivative of e to the x. You know it's going to be embedded in some other problems. We're going to have numbers in there. We're going to have x cubed. We're going to have more fun stuff. So let's get some practice applying all those derivative rules that we know and love from 16a to some exponential functions. And the first one, um, is everybody okay if I erase this? I'm pausing for a second, watching the chat. I'm not seeing questions in the chat. Going once, going twice. Take a quick, a quick screenshot. Okay. So I would say the first one that for sure is going to come up is just using the chain rule. So if I've got um, f of x is equal to e to the x squared, then really chain rule wise, if I have e to some stuff, then our derivative is e to that stuff times stuff prime, 
right? At its heart, that's what our chain rule says. So if I take the derivative of e to the x squared, I get e to the x squared back, exactly the same function back, but then times the derivative of the function. So our derivative of x squared is 2x. If this said e to the 3x minus x to the fourth, then when we take the derivative, we get e to all that stuff times the derivative of all that stuff, 3 minus 4x cubed. And there's an exponential chain rule problem that looks simple, but more students miss it than these. And that is if I just put a constant somewhere. So if I write f of x is equal to 5 e to the x, and I ask you for the derivative, I know it feels like this should be simpler, but I see students make more mistakes here or waste time thinking that they have to do a product rule. But don't think that hard. If this said 5x squared, you would know what to do with it. That 5 is just coming along for the ride because it's being multiplied. So this is just 5x squared, 5 e to x. Similarly, I see a lot of students make mistakes if I put a number up here with the x. I'll go ahead and make it negative just for fun. But if we take that derivative, I get e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And the derivative of negative 6x is negative 6. And it's totally fine to write this as negative 6 e to the negative 6x. But I would say those two more students miss than more complicated derivative problems. Because I think when it's complicated, you kind of slow down and take a breath and you're like, oh, I have to remember to do these three things. But sometimes these get rushed a little. So let's pop back into the homework assignment and take a look at Which problem were you looking at? Problem four? No, problem two. Problem two. Oh yeah, there's definitely chain rule, all kinds of stuff in those. Um, is there one in particular or should we just roll through them? Yeah, for sure. So I am now on homework two, problem two. And our function is e to the square root of x. If I'm looking at e to the square root of x, and I know I'm going to have to take the derivative of this, we kind of have two options, but our basic framework here is still going to be e to some stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So this next step comes down to how you personally think about the derivative of the square root of x. So taking like a 16a step back, if I had y equals the square root of x, I could choose to rewrite that as x to the one half power, which means that when I take the derivative, I'd get one half x to the negative one half power. And this is totally fine. And then sometimes in 16a, people choose to rewrite that to say, oh, well, the negative means that really this whole thing should be on the bottom of the fraction. So like one over two times x to the one half power. And then you could even choose to rate that as one over two square root x. 
choices. If this is option A and this is option B, which do you all prefer for writing the derivative of the square root of X? Votes for A, votes for B, B wins. Okay, so I would rate this like that. Or if you want to put the whole thing as a single fraction, you could also write e to the square root of x over 2 root x. It's not wrong to write it this other way. This, I don't know. It's, I think it's prettier. That's completely subjective. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's pop in here. I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna skip one because I don't really feel like doing the quotient rule right now, but I do think we should talk about this one that looks like e to the negative one. And I don't like the way that's typed. So I wanna make it really clear. <laughs> this is e to the negative one over x squared. And we're being asked to take the derivative of this. So for starters, because it's e to the something, I know we're gonna end up with e to the something. And then that chain rule part says, I have to put the derivative of this in there. And kind of like I did on the last problem, what I'm going to do, I'm digging these boards. <laughs> what I'm going to do here is come off to the side. And if I just had negative one over x squared, and I had to take the derivative of that like six, as a 16a problem, I would rewrite that to say y equals negative x to the negative two. Because if I can make it look like a number times x to a power, then that's usually our best option for taking a derivative. So when I take that derivative, negative, the negative one in front times the negative two will make it a positive two X to the negative three. And then you can choose to leave it like that or to write that as two over X cubed. So I would pop this in here for our chain rule. You were going to ask me a different problem. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, like, so when it comes to this one, um, the first step is going to be the chain rule and so do Sorry. Yeah. If, it, if the exponent is anything more complicated than just x, or even just an easy x raised to a power, then I really think about it kind of in two steps like that, that e to some stuff when you take the derivative, you get the e to the stuff times derivative of the stuff. And if it helps you to write that derivative out on the side, by all means, do it. Um, I did kind of want to jump down. Me, So we've got about seven minutes. I wanted to jump down and do one of the tangent line problems. Okay. Just turn my two into a four. And they moved. I don't know where. Bad day to be showing up late or awkward day to be showing up. 
Um, okay, so in problem four, we're being asked to write the equation of a tangent line. So I think we talked about this a little bit on Friday, but if we're going to write the equation of a tangent line, just kind of reminding ourselves of things from 16B, A, 16A, brain 16B. I got this. Um, reminding ourselves of things from 16A. When I write that equation for a tangent line, I'm usually thinking about it as like a y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And because we've been given a point already, we can get some um, partial credit already. So y minus 1 over e squared equals m times x minus 1. And really, the only thing we have to do is to figure out the slope. And to find the slope, I'm going to take the derivative and plug in the point I'm at. But this derivative is going to involve a quotient rule. I'm going to give you all a couple minutes to try to take that derivative on your own. How about using our quotient rule? Derivative at the top is one, or multiply by the bottom. Then I leave the top alone and multiply by the derivative at the bottom, which is going to be e to the 2x times 2. And then on the bottom, I've got e to the 2x whole thing squared. Now, you might decide to simplify some stuff, but we only care about the derivative at the point where x equals 1. So I would choose to just plug in the 1 right now and go from there. So our slope would look like, well, e 2 times 1 is 2, so that's e squared minus, that's a 1, that's a 2, that's a 1, so that'll be 2 e squared. And then on the bottom, powers raised to powers I would multiply. So that's e squared, but then when I square it, that'll be e to the fourth. So I think I get negative e squared over e to the fourth, or negative one over e squared. And you can just pop that in for the slope. 